one thing that I think that the church has not done a great job of is r relating to young people and being um, bold enough to talk about what they're going through. I was having real problems and I needed somebody to talk to about something important and real to me. The church was not the place to do it because nobody's going to talk about the stuff. Fighting with family members or talk about bad relationships, a friend that's just negative that you need to get away from this person because they're a negative influence on you. And hating yourself, hating the way that you look. These are things I think the church should be talking about. You come to me, God of your rest. You tell me that's well we too heavy of a subject matter for the Christian market because it's about a young girl that doesn't want to live anymore and she's coming to me in the song. It's a duet that we sing together and so she comes to me in the song and says, I just want to say goodbye. My life is over. And I'm saying back to her, um, if you, basically, if you give me a chance, it'll be the last night you ever spend alone. You're worth something. And of course in the song it's meant to be God talking to a person. And, and I really felt that was a little heavy for the Christian market, but I mean, it's got thousands and thousands of responses, uh, letters, uh, MySpace comments, I've talked to people face to face. But this song changed my life. Thanks so much for, for talking about it. I think that's what we're doing. I think we're a bridge to non-Christians. They see us, they go, oh, so Christians can play rock music and have fun and be nice and friendly and loving and all that. I think we're also a bridge to, for Christians to say, well, maybe that is okay to, to, to hang out, you know, with those people, to be an influence. Fight against that. Give me a holla. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why act like you're living for Jesus if you're not, you know? <laughs> God is, is so real and so powerful that he actually is the best thing going. People are starting to see love as acceptance. So therefore, you know, this is your belief and I accept you for that. It's very relative. He says, I am the way, the truth and the life. He's the only way to the Father. The only way through, to salvation is through Christ. So if you are a follower of Christ, you have to believe that. And if you don't, then you're not really a Christian. You know, you, you can't believe in all these ways to God. <clears throat> If you're a Christian, there is one way, that's it. My mom got uh, deathly ill with cancer when I was in sixth grade. And it was, you know, late November. I was old enough to understand, but it was very difficult, the idea that we weren't going to have Christmas on Christmas Day, because my mom was in the hospital, you know, and not opening any presents, not celebrating the day. My dad was up there, I was the same with my grandparents. And, you know, um, I think that that really kind of taught me at a very young age what life was about. And all of a sudden Christmas, and all of a sudden Christmas doesn't really matter. You just want your mom to be okay, you know. So she say, if I do die from cancer, you can't be mad at God. And I always locked it back in my memory. God has a plan. He does whatever he wants to do. And he's great no matter what. I think if I could encourage uh, especially young people in anything, it would be not to wait until you're an old person to make a difference for Christ. I know I talk to a lot of young people that feel like one day down the road, either in college or after college or after I have kids, I'll get things sorted out and I'll be a good Christian man or a good Christian woman, something like that. And, and I know I talk to a lot of young people that say I don't have anything to live for, nothing's real, I don't want to fake it, I'm tired of all of this. And that is when Jesus became a friend to me. He became my best friend and he would never leave me, he would never forsake me. And whenever I needed to talk, he was always there for me and gave me hope. It was the only thing that gave me hope at all during this time. And it was at that point in my life when I realized that I didn't so much need a hero anymore as much as I needed to be a hero and to, to show people who Christ is, to show them no matter what you're going through that um, there is hope. Stop waiting around for someone else to change the world. God's calling you to make a difference right now in your generation, at your school, at your work. You are not too young and you are not too stupid. If you think you're stupid and young, then you are the perfect candidate for Jesus to use you to change someone's life. So stop wasting your time. Make a difference now, baby. My parents are Christians. Uh, my mom was a Jesus freak Christian, which was awesome. And uh, extremely fanatical believer and uh, taught me about the Bible ever since I you know, can remember. Um, I gave my life to Christ when I was five in my room at night alone. Uh, it's kind of a funny, uh, unique story in some ways, but um, my mom had taught me about the Lord and taught me to 
pray to God since I was, you know, I don't know, very small. And one night in my room, I, I knew that God was telling me to give my heart to Him, so I did when I was five years old. And my friend said, well, you might not know, but there's such thing as Christian rock music. And he gave me a tape from a band called Petra. Yeah. And so I was like, oh my gosh, my life has, has meaning. So I brought, I, I brought it home to my parents. I thought my parents didn't know. And as it turns out, my parents did know there was Christian rock music. And they were not blessed by my friend. And I got another pretty good butt whooping for bringing home satanic paraphernalia, right? And so that began my, my three-year battle to listen to Christian Long story longer, uh, Petra was coming in concert to Memphis. And all my buddies were gone, and my parents would let me go, and I just, I just freaked out. We had like World War III at my house. So finally, my mom made a deal with me. She said, "John, <clears throat> you can't go with your friends. I'm going to take you to the Petra show, and when they start praying to the devil, you will see that it's satanic, and then will you believe me?" And I said, "Yes." So, worst case scenario, you see a few good rock songs. You know what I'm saying? So we went to the show. And halfway through the concert, I could just see my mom just got it. All of a sudden, my mom was just like, these people love Jesus. <laughs> was like, so there you go. And so he finally decides, I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never going to do it all right. I just need a savior. I need to matter. And he reaches out to God. And there's a really cool like scripture reading on the record from Isaiah 53 that is... Um, uh, it's a prophetic scripture about Christ coming and taking all of our sins upon him. And he reaches out to God, and that's kind of the pinnacle of the album. It's, the song is called Salvation, and it's basically a salvation story. So I'm very excited about it because it's such a great, I feel it's such a great way to communicate what really is kind of a normal salvation story, except that it's so full of hope, and, uh, it, and so many people can relate to it on, I think, Christian's and non-Christians can relate to the story and are being are asking questions. Well, you know, what does this mean? The salvation? What is that? You know, when we did the scripture from Isaiah 53, actually, my record executive, who's Jewish, she was like, "That is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. Did you write that?" <laughs> and I said, "No, that's in our uh, Judeo-Christian uh, book we call the Old Testament." You know, and it was this really funny uh, moment. He's like, "That's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard." So, you know, there's. Um, Amazing evangelistic opportunities, I, I pray, for this record. A Secret Held In does it, does it seem like a big deal. You know what I mean? Uh, well, but a lot of, I think what happens is it becomes a, a bit of a double life. For instance, uh, pornography is probably one I would imagine that you get a lot of with young guys. Before you know it, you you're actually have a split identity. So you, you don't know who you are. You act this way in front of your parents or your friends or everybody else, and then you act this way when, when nobody else is around. So you actually are losing your identity and you're, you're split. So I think, you know, the Bible is a confession. You know, it, it, uh, that he's faithful to forgive us if we confess our sins. I think that it's great to have somebody that you can confess your sins to. I don't, I'm not talking about a priest. I'm talking about, uh, of course we confess to Christ, but a brother you know, in Christ, a pastor, a youth minister, um, somebody that can help you break these addictions. Because addictions are things that, well, that's what they are. You're not free. You're, you are addicted to something, you know. Silly as it is, I quit drinking Dr. Pepper. That was my number one addiction of my life, you know. I literally wake up and I'd be like, oh, this day sucks. I just I want a Dr. Pepper. As silly as it is, it was the thing I was running to to kind of make me feel better, you know. And I was just like, I've had enough of this addiction, you know, so I just stopped and I broke it. And it just feels good to not have to have that in my life. But there are really dark addictions that we can have, whether it's lying or whatever, pornography we've already talked about, or cutting or depression, all these things. So I think to have somebody confess it to, they can help you change because you, you, you need to have an identity. And, and we believe that, that your truest identity is not in the clothes you wear, the music you listen to, you know, the new gadget that you may have, the new app. Your true identity as a Christian is in Christ. And He makes you a new creation, so then all those things don't matter so much.